Chapter 1 When a traveler through north-central Massachusetts takes the wrong turn at the Aylesbury Road junction just past Dean's Corners, he finds himself entering a strange and sparsely populated country. The terrain becomes steeper and the overgrown stone walls increasingly box in the winding dirt road. The trees of the forests are exceedingly large there, and the undergrowth, brambles, and grass reach a luxuriance seldom seen in inhabited regions. On the contrary, the cultivated fields are very sparse and barren, while the few houses scattered along the road present a strikingly uniform appearance of decrepitude, dirt, and ruin. Without knowing exactly why, one dares not ask anything of the wrinkled, solitary figures one sees from time to time peering out from half-ruined gates or from steep, rocky meadows. These people are so silent and aloof that one has the impression that one is faced with a hidden enigma about which it is better not to try to find out anything. And that feeling of strange restlessness worsens when, from a stop on the road, you can see the mountains that rise above the dense forests that cover the region. The peaks are too oval and symmetrical in shape to think of a peaceful and normal nature, and strange circles formed by tall stone columns can sometimes be seen outlined with singular sharpness against the sky, which crown most of the mountain peaks. The road is cut by ravines and gorges of uncertain depth, and the crude wooden bridges that cross them do not offer excessive guarantees to the traveler. When the path begins to descend, it crosses swampy terrain that instinctively arouses a deep revulsion, and even a sensation of fear invades the traveler when, at sunset, invisible nightjars begin to utter shrill cries, and fireflies, in abnormal profusion, they prepare to dance to the harsh and atrociously monotonous rhythm of the horrific croaking of the toads. The narrow, Shimmering waters of the upper reaches of the Miskatonic take on a strange meandering shape as they flow beneath the vaulted mountain peaks between which it rises. As the traveler approaches the mountains, he pays more attention to their leafy slopes than to their peaks crowned by high stones. The slopes of those mountains are so steep and somber that one wishes they would stay at a distance, but one has to keep going because there is no way to avoid them. Across a covered bridge a small town can be seen crouching between the river course and the sheer side of Round Mountain, and the traveler marvels at the handful of dilapidated Dutch-style roofs that suggest a architectural period prior to that of the surrounding region. And when you get closer, it is not at all reassuring to see that most of the houses are deserted and half-ruined and that the church, with its broken spire, now houses the only dilapidated. Mercantile Establishment of the Whole Village The simple passage of the gloomy tunnel of the bridge already instills a certain fear, but there is no way to avoid it either. Once through the tunnel, it's hard not to be struck by a slight stench as you pass along the main road and see the decay and grime accumulated over the centuries. It is always comforting to leave that place and, following the narrow path that runs under the mountains, crossing the plain that extends beyond the mountain peaks until it ends again at the Aylesbury Road. Once there, the traveler may find out that he has passed through Dunwich. Strangers are seldom seen in Dunwich, and after the horrors in the town all the signs indicating how to reach it have disappeared from the road. Despite being a region of singular beauty, according to the aesthetic canons in vogue, it does not attract artists or vacationers at all. Two centuries ago, when people did not think of laughing at witchcraft, satanic cults or sinister beings that inhabited the forests, they gave very good reasons to avoid going through the town. But in today's rational times, the horror that was unleashed on Dunwich in 1928 by those who care above all else for the well-being of the town and the world silenced, people avoid the town without knowing exactly why. Perhaps the reason for this is, though it cannot be applied to uninformed outsiders, that the Dunwich natives have degraded themselves in a most repulsive way 
having far exceeded that path of regression so common to many remote corners of New England. Dunwich's people have come to form a racial type of their own, with well-defined physical and mental stigmas of degeneracy and inbreeding. Their average level of intelligence is unbelievably low, while their annals reek of perversity and semi-covert murder, incest and countless acts of unspeakable violence and evil. The local aristocracy, represented by the two or three family lines that came from Salem in 1692, have managed to stay somewhat above the general level of degeneracy, although numerous branches of such lineages eventually became so submerged among the sordid rabble that only their remains remain. Surnames as a reminder of the origin of their misfortune. Some of the Waitleys and Bishops still send their firstborn to Harvard and Miskatonic, but the youngsters who leave rarely return to the crumbling Dutch-style roofs under which they and their ancestors were born. And they grew. No one, not even those who know the reasons for the recent horror, can say what is happening to Dunwich, although the old legends allude to idolatrous rites and conclaves of the Indians in which they invoked mysterious figures from the great mountains topped within the shape of a vault while they officiated savage orgiastic rituals answered by shrill creaking and roars coming from inside the mountains. In 1747, the Reverend Abijah Hoadley, new to his ministry at the Dunwich Congregational Church, preached a memorable sermon on the threat of Satan and his demons hanging over the village in which, among other things, he said, It cannot be denied that such monstrosities— members of an infernal procession of demons, are two well-known phenomena to try to deny them. The impious voices of Azazel and Buzrul, Beelzebub and Belial, are heard today coming out of the earth by more than twenty trustworthy witnesses. And even myself, not more than two weeks ago, I was able to listen to a whole speech from the infernal powers. Behind my house the screeches, rolls, moans, screams and whistles that could be heard there could not come from anyone in this world, they were one of those sounds that can only come out of hidden abysses that only black magic can discover and the devil penetrate. It was not long after the reading of this sermon that Reverend Hoadley disappeared without being heard from again, although the text of the sermon, printed in Springfield, remains extant. There was not a year in which loud noises were not heard and reported inside the mountains, and even today such noises continue to puzzle geologists and physiographers. Other traditions refer to fetid odors in the vicinity of the circles of rocky columns that crown the mountain peaks and ethereal entities whose presence can be diffusely detected at certain hours at the bottom of the great ravines, while other legends try to explain everything based on the Devil's Hop Yard a totally vacant hillside where neither trees nor bushes nor any grass grow. As if that were not enough, the natives of the place are terribly afraid of the noise that the legion of nightjars that populate the region make on warm nights. They claim that such birds are psychopomps, one, that lie in wait for the souls of the dead and that synchronize their terrifying chirps with the gasping breath of the dying man. If they manage to catch the fugitive soul at the moment it leaves the body, they immediately flutter and burst into devilish laughter, but if their intentions are thwarted, they gradually fall silent. Of course, these stories are no longer heard and no one believes in them, since they date from very ancient times. Dunwich is an incredibly old town, older than any other within thirty miles. To the south you can still see the cellar walls and chimney of the ancient bishop house, built before 1700, while the ruins of the mill on the waterfall, built in 1806, are the most recent piece of architecture in the location. Industry did not take root in Dunwich and the 19th century factory movement proved to be short-lived in the town. Most ancient, however, are the great circumferences of roughly hewn stone columns on the mountaintops, but this work is generally attributed more to the Indians than to the colonists. Remains of human skulls and bones, 
found inside these circles and around the large table-shaped rock of Sentinel Hill, support the belief that these places were once burial sites for the Pocomtuck Indians, even though numerous ethnologists, ignoring the practical impossibility of such a crazy theory, they continue to believe that they are Caucasian remains. Chapter 2 It was in the borough of Dunwich, on a large and partly uninhabited farmhouse built on a hillside four miles from town and a half from the nearest house, that on Sunday, February 2, 1913, at five in the morning, he was born. Wilbur Watley The date is remembered because it was the day of Candlemas, which the residents of Dunwich curiously observe under another name, and, furthermore, because of the roar of the noises that were heard on the mountain and because of the uproar of the dogs of the region that they didn't stop barking all night. It is also worth noting, though this is less important, that Wilbur's mother belonged to the debased branch of the Waitleys. She was an albino of thirty-five years of age, somewhat misshapen and unprepossessing, who lived in the company of her elderly and half-crazed father, of whom during her youth spread the most hideous rumors of acts of witchcraft. Lavinia Whaley had no known husband, but following county custom she did nothing to repudiate the child, and as to the newborn's paternity people could, and did, speculate to their heart's content. The mother was strangely proud of that creature with the swarthy complexion and goatish features that contrasted so much with her sickly countenance and her pinkish albino eyes, and they say that she was heard whispering a multitude of strange prophecies about the extraordinary faculties with which the child was endowed. And the awesome future that awaited him. Lavinia was quite capable of saying such things, for she had always been a solitary creature who loved to run through the mountains when thunderous storms raged and who liked to read the voluminous and old books that her father had inherited after two centuries of existence from the Waitleys, books that were beginning to fall apart from pure old and moth-eaten. He had never been to school in his life, but he knew by heart a multitude of unconnected bits of old folktale that old Waitley had taught him. The lonely farmhouse had always been feared by the locals because of old Waitley's fame as a witch, and the inexplicable violent death of his wife when Lavinia was barely twelve did nothing to make the place popular. Always lonely and isolated in the midst of strange influences, Lavinia liked to indulge in hallucinating and grandiose visions, as well as singular occupations. Her spare time was scarcely diminished by domestic care in a house in which not even the slightest principles of order and cleanliness had been observed for some time. On the night Wilbur was born, a hideous scream could be heard, booming even above the noises of the mountain and the barking of the dogs, but, as far as is known, no doctor or midwife was present when he came into the world. The neighbors knew nothing of the birth until a week later, when old Wadley rode his sleigh up the snowy lane between his house and Dunwich and spoke incoherently to the group of villagers assembled in Osborne's shop. It seemed as if a change had taken place in the old man, like if a new surreptitious element had entered his bewildered brain, transforming him from an object into a subject of fear, although, to tell the truth, he was not a person who cared particularly about family matters. Still, she displayed some of the pride that had lately been apparent in her daughter, and what she said about the paternity of the newborn would be remembered years later by those who heard her words then. I don't care what people think. If Lavinia's son resembles his father, it will be very different from what can be expected. There is no reason to believe that there are no other people than those seen in these outskirts. Lavinia has read and seen things most of you can't even imagine. I hope your man will be as good a husband as can be found in this part of Aylesbury, and if you knew half the things I know you wouldn't want a better church marriage here or anywhere. Listen well to what I tell you, one day you will all hear Lavinia's son pronounce his father's name on the top of Sentinel Hill. The only people who saw Wilbert during the first month of his life were old Zechariah Waitley, 
of the still undegenerate branch of the Waitleys, and Mamie Bishop, the woman with whom Earl Sawyer had lived for years. Mamie's visit was out of sheer curiosity, and the stories she told confirmed her observations, while Zechariah went along to bring a pair of Alderney cows that old Waitley had bought for his son Curtis. This purchase marked the beginning of a long series of cattle purchases by Little Wilbur's family that would not end until 1928, that is, the year the Dunwich Horror befell, but never gave the impression that Waitley's ramshackle stable was filled to overflowing with cattle. This was followed by a period when the curiosity of certain Dunwich residents led them to sneak up to the pastures and count the cattle grazing precariously on the steep slope just above the old farmhouse, and they could never count more than ten or twelve anemic and almost bloodless specimens. It must be some pest or disease, originating perhaps from the unhealthy pastures or transmitted by some tainted fungus or wood from the filthy barn that caused such high mortality among Waitley's cattle. Strange wounds or sores, resembling incisions, seemed to feed on the cows that could be seen grazing in those parts, and once or twice in the first months of Wilbur's life some people who came to visit the Waitleys thought they saw sores. Similar in the throat of the graying and unshaven old man and in that of his disheveled and disheveled albino daughter. In the spring after Wilbur's birth, Lavinia resumed her habitual forays through the mountains, carrying her dark-skinned creature in her disproportionate arms. The villagers' curiosity about the Waitley subsided upon seeing the offspring, and no one thought to comment on the newborn's prodigious development, visible from one day to the next. The reality is that Wilbur was growing at an impressive rate, since at three months he had already reached a size and muscular strength that is rarely seen in children under one year of age. His movements and even his vocal sounds showed a restraint and ponderance quite unusual in a child of his age, and hardly anyone was surprised when, at seven months, he began to walk without any help, with little hesitations that after a month they had completely disappeared. Soon after, Exactly on Halloween, a great bonfire could be seen at midnight on the top of Sentinel Hill, where the ancient table-shaped stone stood in the midst of a mound of ancient skeletons. All sorts of rumors ran through the village after Silas Bishop, of the undegraded branch of the bishops, said to have seen the Waitley boy hurrying up the mountain in front of his mother, just an hour before the warning of the calls. Silas was searching for a stray calf, but he almost forgot his quest when he caught a glimpse, by the light of the lantern he was carrying, of the two figures running up the mountain. Mother and son were slipping stealthily through the undergrowth, and Silas, in astonishment, thought he saw that they were stark naked. Looking back on it later, he wasn't entirely sure about the boy, and he thinks it's possible he was wearing some sort of fringed belt and a pair of dark-colored breeches or trousers. The truth is that Wilbur was never seen again, at least alive and in a conscious state, without all his clothes on and buttoned tightly, and any disorder, real or supposed, in his clothing seemed to irritate him greatly. His contrast with the scrawny appearance of his mother and grandfather was tremendously stark, something that would not be fully explained until 1928, the year the Dunwich Horror fell. Around the month of January, among the rumors that ran through the town, mention was made that the black boy from Lavinia had begun to speak when he was barely eleven months old. Their language was impressive, both because it differed from the normal accents heard in the region and because of the absence of the childish babble seen in many three and four-year-olds. He was not a talkative creature, but when he did speak he seemed to express something elusive and totally unknown to the people of Dunwich. The strangeness did not lie in what he said or in the simple expressions he resorted to, but rather seemed to have a vague relationship with the tone or with the vocal organs that produce syllabic sounds. His features were also characterized by a note of maturity 
for although he had in common with his mother and grandfather the lack of a chin, his nose, firm and precociously outlined, together with the expression of his eyes, large, dark and Latin features, made him seem almost adult and gifted with unusual intelligence. Despite its apparent brilliance, it was nonetheless downright ugly. Certainly, there was something chotuno or animal in his full lips, in his yellowish and porous complexion, in his rough and unkempt hair and in his incredibly long ears. Soon people began to dislike him, even more markedly than they did his mother and grandfather, and everything they ventured to say about him was peppered with references to old Waitley's wizarding past and how the mountains rumbled when he uttered at the top of his lungs the frightful name of Yogg-Sothoth, in the middle of a circle of stones and with a great open book in his hands. The dogs became enraged at the mere presence of the boy, to the point that he was continually forced to defend himself against their threatening barking. Chapter 3 Meanwhile Old Waitley continued to buy cattle without any increase in his herd numbers. He also felled wood and began restoring the hitherto unused portions of the house, a spacious building with a peaked roof and the rear façade fully embedded in the rocky mountainside. Until then, the three less dilapidated rooms on the ground floor had sufficed for him and his daughter. The old man still had to retain prodigious strength to be able to carry out such an arduous task by himself, and although he sometimes muttered things that were out of the ordinary, his carpentry work showed that he was still sane. Work began as soon as Wilbur was born, after one day tidying up one of the many tool sheds, boarding it up, and fitting a sturdy new lock. Now, when he undertook the repair work on the abandoned upper story, he still showed himself to be in possession of excellent manual faculties. His mania was reflected only in an effort to board up all the windows in the restored wing tightly with boards, although in the opinion of many the mere fact of trying to repair it was already madness. And it was better explained that he wanted to prepare another room on the ground floor for the newborn grandson, a room that several visitors could see, although no one ever managed to access the upper floor hermetically closed by thick wooden planks. He lined the grandson's room with stout, ceiling-high bookcases, on which he placed, little by little and in apparently careful order, the old moth-eaten volumes and loose fragments of books that had hitherto been badly heaped in the most unusual corners of the house. They've been very useful to me, Wadley was saying, trying to glue together a loose page of Gothic characters with a glue prepared in the rusty kitchen oven, but I'm sure the boy can make better use of them. I want them to be in the best possible conditions, because they are all going to be useful for their education. When Wilbur was one year and seven months old, that is, in September 1914, his height and, in general, the things he did were completely out of the ordinary. He was already the height of a four-year-old child, spoke fluently, and showed a keen intelligence. He walked alone through the fields and steep slopes, and accompanied his mother on her adventures through the mountains. When he was at home, he kept peering at the strange engravings and pictures in his grandfather's books, while old Waitley tutored and catechized him in the silence of many a long, endless afternoon. By then the work on the house had been completed, and those who had occasion to see it wondered why old Waitley had turned one of the upstairs windows into a massive boarded door. It was the last dormer window on the west-facing rear façade, against the mountainside, and no one had the slightest idea why he would have built a solid wooden ramp to climb up to it. By the time the works were about to end, people noticed that the the old tool shed, sealed shut and boarded up the windows since Wilbur's birth, once again lay derelict. The door was always wide open, and when Earl Sawyer went inside one day, on a visit to Old Waitley in connection with the sale of cattle, he was greatly surprised at the stinking smell of the shed, a stench, as he would say later, 
that bore no resemblance to anything known except the smell that was perceived in the vicinity of the Indian circles of the mountain, and that could not come from anything healthy or from this earth. But it is also true that the houses and sheds of the Dunwich residents were never exactly characterized by their good smells. There is nothing noteworthy in the months that followed, except that everyone swore to hear a slight but steady increase in the mysterious noises coming from the mountain. On the eve of May 1, 1915, there were such tremors that even the residents of Aylesbury could perceive them, and a few months later, on Halloween, there was an astonishingly timed underground rumble with a series of flames, there's the Waitleys at their witchcraft again, said the Dunwich folks, on top of Sentinel Hill. Wilbur continued to grow at a prodigious rate, to the point that by the time he was four he looked as if he were ten. He read avidly, without any help, but had become much more reserved. His countenance was naturally taciturn, and for the first time people began to speak of the incipient demonic aspect of his goatish features. Sometimes he began to mutter in a totally unknown jargon and sing strange melodies that made those who heard them shudder with an inexpressible terror. The aversion that the dogs showed towards him was the subject of frequent comments, to the point of being forced to always carry a pistol on him to avoid being attacked in his forays through the countryside. And, of course, his use of the weapon on several occasions did nothing to endear him to watchdog owners. The few visitors to the Waitley's house often found Lavinia alone downstairs, while strange cries and footsteps were heard on the boardwalk above. Lavinia never said what her father and the boy could be doing up there, although on one occasion when a jovial fishmonger tried to open the locked door that led to the stairs, her face turned pale and a cerebral panic spread over her face. The fishmonger later recounted in the Dunwich shop that he thought he heard the stamping of a horse upstairs. The customers who happened to be in the shop at that moment thought instantly of the door, and the ramp, and the cattle disappearing with such swiftness, and shuddered to remember the tales of old Waitley's early days, and the strange things the lady uttered. Earth when a calf is sacrificed at an auspicious moment to certain pagan gods. It had long been known that the dogs feared and loathed the Waitley estate with the same fury that they had formerly shown towards the person of Wilbur. In 1917 war broke out, and Justice of the Peace Sawyer Waitley, in his capacity as chairman of the local draft board, had great difficulty in constituting the contingent of fit young men from Dunwich for the boot camp. The government, alarmed at the signs of the degradation of the inhabitants of the country, sent several officials and medical specialists to investigate the causes, who carried out a survey that is still remembered by the readers of New England newspapers. The publicity that was given Surrounding the investigation put some journalists on the trail of the Waitleys, and led the Sunday editions of the Boston Globe and the Arkham Advertiser to publish sensational articles about Wilbur's precocity, Old Waitley's Black Magic, the shelves full of strange volumes, the hermetically closed second story of the old farmhouse, the mystery that surrounded the whole region and the noises that were heard on the mountain. Wilbur was four and a half years old at the time, but he had every aspect of a boy of fifteen. His upper lip and cheeks were covered with coarse, dark hair, and his voice had already begun to grow hoarse. One day Earl Sawyer went to the Waitley estate accompanied by a group of journalists and photographers, drawing their attention to the strange stench coming from the upper floor. It was exactly the same as the smell in the abandoned tool shed after the rebuilding was completed, he said, and very similar to the faint odors he thought he sometimes smelled near the stone circle on the mountain. The people of Dunwich read the stories about the Waitleys when they saw them in the newspapers, and could not help but smile at the gross errors they contained. They wondered, too, why the reporters should make such a big deal about old Waitley always paying in ancient gold coins when he bought his cattle. 
The Waitleys greeted their visitors with ill-concealed disgust, though they dared not offer violent resistance or refuse to answer their questions for fear they would give the case more publicity. Chapter 4 For a full decade the Waitley story became inextricably entwined with the general existence of a pathologically diseased community that was accustomed to their bizarre behavior and had grown numb to their orgiastic celebrations of May Eve and All Hallows. Twice a year the Waitleys made bonfires on the top of Sentinel Hill, and at such times the noise of the mountain was reproduced with more and more unusual violence, and it was also not uncommon for strange and portentous events to take place on his lonely farmhouse at any other time of the year. Over time, visitors reported hearing noises in the locked upstairs, even when everyone in the family was downstairs, and wondered at what rate the Waitleys used to slaughter a cow or calf. There was even talk of reporting the case to the SPCA, but in the end nothing was done as Dunwich's residents had no desire to be noticed by the outside world. About 1923, when Wilbur was a boy of ten and with an intelligence, voice, stature, and beard that gave him every appearance of a mature person, a second stage of carpentry work began on the old Waitley estate. The works were taking place on the closed upper floor, and from the pieces of leftover wood that could be seen on the floor, people deduced that the young man and the grandfather had knocked down all the partitions and even raised the floorboards, leaving only a large space. Open between the ground floor and the peaked roof. They had also demolished the great central chimney and installed in the rusty space that was left exposed a flimsy tin pipe with an outlet to the outside. In the spring after the work old Waitley noticed the increasing number of nightjars coming from the cold spring ravine at night to squeal under his window. Waitley attached a special significance to the presence of such birds, and said one day in Osborne's shop that he believed his end was near. Now they chirp in time with my breathing, he said, so they must already be lying in wait to pounce on my soul. They know she's going to leave me soon and they don't want to let her get away. When he is dead you will know if they succeeded or not. If they succeeded, they would not stop screeching and guffawing until dawn, otherwise they will shut up. I wait for them and for the souls they trap because if they want my soul it will cost them theirs. On the night of the Harvest Festival, too, in 1924, Dr. Houghton of Aylesbury received an urgent call from Wilbur Waitley, who had galloped into the prevailing darkness at the only horse that still remained to the Waitleys, in order to reach the town as soon as possible and telephone from Osborne's store. Dr. Houghton found old Waitley in a dying state, with a heart rate and rattling breathing that heralded an imminent end. The deformed albino daughter and the adolescent grandson, but already bearded, stood by the deathbed, while from the gloomy space that opened above their heads came the unpleasant sensation of some kind of splashing or rhythmic waves, something like the noise of the waves on a beach with calm waters. However, what bothered the doctor the most was the deafening shouting made by the night birds that fluttered around the house, a veritable legion of nightjars screeching their monotonous message devilishly in sync with the broken gasps of the dying old man. This was decidedly beyond the sinister and monstrous, thought Dr. Houghton, who like everyone else in the country had come very reluctantly to the Waitley house in response to the urgent call made to him. About one o'clock old Waitley regained consciousness, and as his rattle subsided, he stammered some broken words to his grandson. More space, Willie, he needs more space and as soon as possible. You grow, but that grows even faster. It will serve you soon, son. Throw open the gates to Yog sothoth by chanting the long chant you'll find on page 751 of the complete edition, then set the prison on fire. The fire of the earth cannot burn it. There was no doubt that old Waitley was mad as hell.
After a pause during which the flock of nightjars outside synchronized their chirps to the new panting rhythm of the old man's breathing and strange noises could be heard coming from some remote place in the mountains, he still had the strength to utter another sentence or two. Don't stop feeding him, Willie, and keep the amount in mind at all times. But don't let it grow too fast for the place, for if it bursts to pieces or is out before you open Yogg-Sothoth, all your efforts will be for nothing. Only those who come from the afterlife can make it reproduce and take effect. Only they, the old people who want to return. But after the last words, old Waitley's death rattles began again, and Lavinia gave a terrifying cry as she watched the roar of the nightjars change to match the new rhythm of their breathing. There was no change for an hour, at which time the dying man's throat let out the last gasp. Dr. Houghton's wrinkled lids closed over the old man's gleaming gray eyes, while the din of the bird subsided momentarily until finally falling into utter silence. Lavinia sobbed all the time, while Wilbur chuckled, and the faint roar of the mountain reached them. They haven't caught his soul. Wilbur whispered in his powerful bass voice. By then Wilbur was already a scholar of impressive erudition, if in his own partial way, and he was becoming known for his correspondence with numerous librarians in remote places where rare and mysterious books of bygone ages were kept. At the same time, he was more and more loathed and feared in the Dunwich region because of the disappearance of certain young men whom all the suspicions made to gather, diffusely, on the threshold of his house. But he always managed to silence the investigations, either by resorting to intimidation or by making use of the wealth of ancient gold coins that, as in his grandfather's time, came out periodically and in increasing quantities for the purchase of heads of cattle. He gave every impression of a mature person, and his height, once he had reached the normal limit of adulthood, seemed as if it would continue to increase without limit. In 1925, on the occasion of a visit that did a correspondent of his from Miskatonic University, who came out of their meeting livid and bewildered, already a good six foot three quarters tall. As the years passed, Wilbur treated his half-deformed, albino mother with increasing contempt, even forbidding her to accompany him into the mountains on May Eve and All Hallows' Day. In 1926, the unfortunate mother told Mamie Bishop that she was afraid of her son. I know a lot about him that I wish I could tell you, Mamie, he said to her one day, but there's a lot going on lately that even I don't know. I swear to God I don't even know what my son wants or what he's trying to do. On Halloween that year, the sounds of the mountain resounded with uncharacteristic fury, and like every year the glow of flames could be seen on the top of Sentinel Hill. But people paid more attention to the rhythmic screeching of huge flocks of nightjars, strangely late for their time of year, which seemed to congregate in the vicinity of the Waitley Farm. After midnight their strident notes broke out in a kind of infernal racket that could be heard throughout the country, and until dawn they did not cease their deafening shouting. They then disappeared, rushing south, where they arrived a month behind their normal date. What size roar meant no one would know for sure for a long time. In any case, no one died in the whole county that night, but the unfortunate Lavinia Waitley, Wilbur's misshapen, albino mother, was never seen again. In the summer of 1917 Wilbur repaired two sheds in the barnyard and began moving his books and personal effects into them. Soon after, Earl Sawyer told Osborne's shop that the Whaley farm had started carpentry work again. Wilbur was getting ready to board up all the doors and windows on the ground floor, and it looked as if he was tearing down all the partitions, just as he and his grandfather had done upstairs four years ago. He had taken up residence in one of the sheds, and according to Sawyer he looked a bit worried and fearful. The local people suspected that he knew something about his mother's disappearance, 
and very few dared to wander in the vicinity of the Waitley farm. At that time, Wilbur was already over seven feet tall and there was nothing to indicate that he was going to stop growing. Chapter 5 That winter brought with it the not inconsiderable event of Wilbur's first trip out of Dunwich country. Despite the correspondence he had been maintaining with the Widener Library at Harvard, the National Library in Paris, the British Museum, the University of Buenos Aires and the Miskatonic University Library in Arkham, all his attempts to get hold of a book he desperately needed had been unsuccessful. Whereupon he eventually went himself, ragged, filthy, with his unkempt beard and that unpolished dialect he spoke, to consult the copy at Miskatonic, the nearest library to Dunwich. Nearly eight feet tall and carrying a used suitcase fresh from Osborne's store, the dark-skinned, goat-faced scarecrow turned up in Arkham one day in search of the fearsome volume kept under lock and key in the university library. From Miskatonic, the terrifying Necronomicon, by the mad Arab Abdul Alhazard, in a Latin version by Olus Wormius, printed in Spain in the 17th century. Wilbur had never seen a city before, but his only interest when he arrived in Arkham was finding his way to the university campus. Once there, he walked undeterred past the large guard dog at the gate, which began to bark, bearing its white fangs at him with uncharacteristic fury as it yanked violently at the thick chain to which it was tied. Wilbur carried with him the priceless, but incomplete, copy of the English version of Dr. D's Necronomicon that his grandfather had bequeathed to him, and as soon as he was allowed access to the Latin copy, he began to compare the two texts with the purpose of discovering a certain truth. Passage which, if not found to be in faulty condition, should have been found on page 751 of the volume owned by him. As much as he tried to restrain himself, he couldn't help but politely say so to the librarian, Henry Armitage, a man of great learning and a Miskatonic graduate, Ph.D. from Princeton University and John Hopkins University, who had once come to visit him at the Dunwich Farm and now, in a good tone, peppered him with questions. Wilbur ended by telling him that he was looking for some kind of incantation or magical formula that would contain the dreadful name of yog sothoth but the existing discrepancies, repetitions, and ambiguities complicated the task of locating it, plunging him into a sea of doubts. While copying down the formula on which he finally settled, Dr. Armitage involuntarily glanced over Wilbur's shoulder at the pages the book was open to, the one on the left, in the Latin version of the Necronomicon, contained a whole string of shocking threats against the peace and well-being of the world. Neither should it be thought, read the text that Armitage mentally translated, that man is the oldest or the last of the owners of the earth, nor that such a combination of body and soul wanders alone through the universe. The ancients were, the ancients are and the ancients will be not in the spaces we know, but between them. They walk serene and primal in essence, without dimensions and invisible to our sight. Yogg-Sothoth knows the gate. Yogg-Sothoth is the gate. Yogg-Sothoth is the key and the guardian of the gate. Past, present and future, all are one in Yogg-Sothoth. He knows where the elders entered in the past and where they will do so again when the time comes. He knows what regions of the earth they trodden down, where they continue to tread down today, and why no one can see them in their progress. Men sometimes perceive their presence by the odor they give off, but no human being can see their countenance, save only through the features of the men begotten by them, and they are of the most diverse species, differing in appearance from the very image of man to those invisible or substanceless figures that are them. They walk unnoticed and pestilential in the lonely places where the words were spoken and the rituals were uttered in due time. Their voices make the wind tremble and their consciences shake the earth. 
They subdue whole forests and crush cities, but no forest or city has ever seen the destroying hand. Cadith has met them on the frozen wastes, but who knows Cadith? In the glacial desert of the south and in the submerged islands of the ocean, stones rise up on which his seal is engraved, but who has seen the icy sunken city or the secularly closed tower covered with algae and mollusks? Great Cthulhu is his cousin, but can only dimly recognize them. I.A. Shubnigirath. You will know them by their insane smell. Their hand squeezes your throats but even so you don't see them, and their abode is one with the threshold you guard. Yogsothoth is the key that opens the door, through which the spheres meet. Man now rules where they once ruled, but soon they will rule where man now rules. After summer, winter, and after winter, summer. They wait, patient and trusting, for they know that they will reign on earth again. When Dr. Armitage associated what he read with what he had heard of Dunwich and its mysterious apparitions, and of the gloomy and horrible aura that surrounded Wilbur Waitley and that ranged from a birth in more than strange circumstances to a well-founded suspicion of matricide, he felt as if struck by a wave of fear as tangible as any draft of cold, sticky air from a grave could be. It seemed as if the goat-faced giant engrossed in reading that book had been engendered on another planet or dimension, as if he were only partially human and came from the dark abysses of an essence and an entity that spread like a titanic ghost. Beyond the spheres of force and matter, of space and time. Suddenly Wilbur raised his head and began to speak in a strange, resonant voice that suggested vocal organs different from those of ordinary mortals. Mr. Armitage, he said, I'm afraid I'm going to have to take the book home. It talks about things that I have to experience under certain conditions that I don't meet here, and it would be a real outrage not to let me get it alleging any absurd bureaucratic rule. I beg you, sir, let me take it home and I swear no one will notice its lack. Needless to say I have to treat it with the best care. I needed to put my version of D in the form that. He broke off at the resolute negative expression on the librarian's face, and at once his goatish features took on a cunning air. Armitage, when he was about to tell him that he could copy anything he needed, suddenly thought of the consequences that could result from such a violation and backed down. It was too great a responsibility to hand over to. That monstrous creature the access key to such dark spheres of the exterior. Waitley, seeing the turn things were taking, tried to put on the best possible face. Well. What are we going to do if he gets like this? Let's see if Harvard isn't so picky and there's more luck. And without saying another word, he got up and left the library, having to bow his head for each door he passed. Armitage could hear the tremendous howl of the big dog in the driveway, and through the window he watched Waitley's gorilla stride as he crossed the small patch of campus that could be seen from the library. The ghastly stories that had come to his ears came to his mind, and he remembered what was said in the Sunday editions of the Advertiser as well as the impressions he had been able to gather among the peasants and residents of Dunwich during his visit to the town. Foul-smelling, invisible beings not of the earth, or, at least, not of the three-dimensional earth we know, ran through the ravines of New England and leered shamelessly from the mountain peaks. He had been convinced of this for a long time, but now he believed he was experiencing the imminent and terrible presence of alien horror and glimpsed a prodigious advance into the dark realms of that ancient and hitherto torpid nightmare. Shaken and with a deep sense of revulsion, he locked the Necronomicon in its place, but an atrocious and unidentifiable stench still permeated the room. You will know them by their insane smell, he quoted. Yes, there was no doubt that fetid odor was the same that had nauseated him less than three years ago at Whaley Farm.
She thought of Wilbur, his sinister goatee features, and gave a wry laugh as she remembered the rumors going around town about his paternity. Incestuous Scion Armitage muttered almost aloud to himself. My God, but they will be simple. Give them a read of Arthur Mackin's The Great God Pan and they'll think it's some ordinary Dunwich scandal. But what shapeless and accursed creature, from this three-dimensional earth or not, was the father of Wilbur Waitley? Born on Candlemas Day, nine months after May 1 Eve, 1912, the date rumors of strange noises from within the earth reached Arkham. What was happening in the mountains that night in May? What horror engendered on the day of the invention of the cross, three, had descended on the world in the form of semi-human flesh and blood? During the weeks that followed, Armitage collected all the information he could find about Wilbur Waitley and those mysterious beings that inhabited the Dunwich County. He contacted Dr. Houghton, of Aylesbury, who had attended old Waitley in his last death throes, and pondered his last words, as the doctor remembered them. A new visit to Dunwich brought hardly any fruit. However, a close examination of the Necronomicon, particularly, of the pages for which Wilbur had so avidly sought, seemed to yield terrifying new clues as to the nature, methods, and appetites of the strange and malignant being whose menace loomed dimly over the land. The conversations held in Boston with various scholars of arcane knowledge and the correspondence maintained with many other scholars from the most diverse places, only increased the perplexity of Armitage, who, after passing gradually through several phases of alarm, ended up plunged into a real state of intense spiritual fear. As the summer approached I believed more and more. That something must be done to stop the escalation of terror that was ravaging the valleys watered by the upper reaches of the Miskatonic and find out who was the monstrous being known among humans by the name of Wilbur Waitley. Chapter 6 The real Dunwich horror took place between the Harvest Festival and the 1928 Equinox, with Dr. Armitage being one of the eyewitnesses to its abominable prologue. He had heard about Waitley's horrendous trip to Cambridge and his desperate attempts to retrieve the copy of the Necronomicon that was kept in the Widener Library at Harvard University. But all his efforts were in vain, for Armitage had put all the librarians in charge of custody of a copy of the arcane volume on alert. Wilbur had been surprisingly nervous at Cambridge, he was anxious to get the book and not least to get home, as if he feared the consequences of a long absence. At the beginning of August the quasi-awaited event took place. In the early morning of the third day of that month, Dr. Armitage was rudely awakened by the heartbreaking and ferocious barking of the imposing guard dog that was at the entrance of the university campus. The shrill and terrible growls alternated with piercing howls and barks, as if the dog had gone mad. The noises were steadily increasing, but intermittent, leaving terribly significant pauses between them. Presently there was heard a terrifying scream from a throat wholly unknown, a scream that woke no less than half the sleepers in Arkham at that hour and would haunt their sleep ever after, a scream that could not be heard. Of any being born on earth or inhabitant of it. Quickly throwing some clothes on top, Armitage began to run through the walks and gardens until he reached the university buildings, where he could see that others had beaten him to it. The rumbling echoes of the library's burglar alarm could still be heard. In the moonlight a window could be seen wide open showing the abysmal darkness that it contained. Whoever had tried to break in had succeeded, for the barking and shouting, soon to fade into a muffled profusion of howling and wailing, had undoubtedly come from within the building. A sixth sense told Armitage that what was happening there was not something that sensitive eyes could contemplate and, with an authoritative gesture, he ordered the crowd back as he opened the hall door. Among those assembled he saw Professor Warren Rice and Dr. Francis Morgan, 
to whom he had shared some of his conjectures and fears long ago, and he waved for them to follow him inside. The sounds emanating from it had almost completely subsided, except for the monotonous growling of the dog, but Armitage gave a sharp start as he noted in the undergrowth a noisy chorus of nightjars that had begun to sing its devilishly rhythmic chirps, as if marching in unison with the last throes of a dying being. The entire building was filled with an unbearable stench that was all too familiar to Armitage, who, accompanied by the two professors, ran across the hall. Vestibule until arriving at the reading room of genealogical topics from where the deaf groans came out. For a few seconds, no one dared turn on the light, until Armitage, stealing himself, flipped the switch. One of the three men, which one, we don't know, let out a shrill yell at what he could see lying on the floor amid a jumble of overturned tables and chairs. Professor Rice states that for a few moments he lost consciousness, although his legs did not give way and he did not fall to the ground. On the ground, above a fetid puddle of purulent liquid between yellowish and greenish and of a bituminous viscosity, lay half reclining a being almost nine feet tall, from which the dog had torn all the clothes and some pieces of the skin. He hadn't died yet. He writhed in silent spasms, his chest heaving in abominable rhythm to the shrill chirps of nightjars peering expectantly from outside the room. Scattered throughout the room were pieces of shoe leather and shreds of clothing, and by the window was an empty canvas backpack that must have been thrown there by that gigantic being. Next to the central desk there was a revolver on the floor with a shot cartridge but no powder that would later serve to explain why it had not been fired. However, that being that lay on the floor eclipsed for a moment any other image that could be in the room. It would be too hackneyed and not quite true to say that no human pen could describe it, but it would be even less wrong to say that it could not be visualized graphically by anyone whose ideas about physiognomy and profile in general were too attached to the forms of life existing on Earth. Our planet and the three known dimensions. There was no doubt that it was partly a human creature, with the hands and head of a man, while its chinless, chotuno face bore the unmistakable hallmark of the Waitleys but the torso and lower limbs were teratologically monstrous in shape. Only thanks to loose clothing could that being walk on the earth without being bothered or eradicated from its surface. Above the waist it was quasi-anthropomorphic, though the chest, on which the dog's rending paws still rested, had the leathery, mesh-like hide of a crocodile or lizard. The back was mottled in color, somewhere between yellow and black, vaguely reminiscent of the scaly skin of certain species of snakes. But by far the most monstrous of the whole body was the lower part. From the waist on, all resemblance to the human body disappeared and the wildest fantasy imaginable began. The skin was covered with a lush, coarse black fur, and a bunch of long, gray-greenish tentacles sprouted from the abdomen, from which flaccidly protruded red suckers that served as mouths. Their arrangement was most bizarre and seemed to follow the symmetries of some unknown cosmic geometry on Earth and even in the solar system. On each hip, sunk in a kind of pinkish, ciliated orbit, was housed what appeared to be a rudimentary eye, while in the place where the tail usually is hung something that looked like a trunk or tentacle, with markings on it purple ring fingers, and multiple signs of an undeveloped mouth or throat. The legs, except for the black fur that covered them, bore a certain resemblance to the limbs of the gigantic lizards that roamed the earth in prehistoric times, ending in fleshy veins that were neither hooves nor claws. When it breathed, its tail and tentacles rhythmically changed color, as if obeying some cause. Circulatory characteristic of its non-human greenish tint, while the tail had a yellowish color alternating with a disgusting-looking grayish-white in the spaces between the violet rings. There was no trace of blood, 
Only the fetid, fetid, yellowish-green liquid that ran across the floor beyond the sticky circle, leaving behind a curious discolored stain. The presence of the three men must have awakened the dying being prostrated there, who began to babble without even turning or raising his head. Armitage did not record the sounds he made in writing, but he categorically states that he did not make a single one in English. At first the syllables defied comparison with any language known on earth, but toward the end he mouthed incoherent fragments that evidently came from the Necronomicon, the abominable book whose search would cost him his death. The fragments, as Armitage recalls them, ran something like this, Nai, Engak Ga, Bugshagag, Waiha, Yogsothoth, Yogsothoth, her voice fading into thin air as the nightjar screeched in a rhythmic crescendo of unhealthy expectation. Then the panting stopped and the dog raised its head in a long, mournful howl. A change took place in the yellowish and chotuna face of that prostrate being on the ground while its large black eyes sank astonishingly into their cavities. Outside the window, the yelling of the night jars suddenly ceased, and above the murmurs of the assembled crowd there was a frantic buzzing and fluttering. Silhouetted against the background of the moon could be seen great clouds of winged watchers waiting, taking flight and fleeing from sight, terrified only to see the prey they were about to pounce on. Suddenly the dog gave a sudden start, gave a terrifying bark, and flung himself headlong out of the window through which it had entered. A whoop went up from the waiting crowd as Armitage shouted to the men waiting outside that until the police or coroner arrived they would not be able to enter the room. Fortunately, the windows were high enough that no one could peek out, for added security, he carefully drew the dark curtains. Meanwhile, two policemen arrived, and Dr. Morgan, meeting them in the hall, urged them, for their own good, to wait to enter the stinking reading room until the coroner arrived and the body could be covered. Of being prostrated there. While this was happening, some truly frightening changes were taking place in that gigantic creature. It is not necessary to describe the kind and rate of shrinking and disintegration that was taking place before the eyes of Armitage and Rice, but it can be said that, apart from the outward appearance of face and hands, the authentically human element in Wilbur Whaley was minimal. When the coroner arrived, there was only a slimy, whitish mass on the floor, while the fetid odor was almost completely gone. Apparently, Whaley had neither a skull nor a bony skeleton, at least as we understand them. In something it had to resemble its unknown progenitor. Chapter 7 but this was merely the prologue to the true horror of Dunwich. The baffled official authorities carried out all the necessary formalities, wisely suppressing the most alarming details so that they would not reach the ears of the press and the general public. Meanwhile, officials came to Dunwich and Aylesbury to deed the late Wilbur Whateley's estates and notify those who might be his rightful heirs accordingly. On their arrival, they found the people of the country in great agitation, both from the increasing roar heard in the vaulted mountains, and from the unbearable smell and sounds, like a surf or splash, which came out more and more. Intensity of that sort of great empty structure which was the Waitley's hermetically boarded up farm. Earl Sawyer, who had cared for the horse and cattle since Wilbur's death, had suffered a serious breakdown. The officials quickly made an excuse for no one to enter the stinking, locked building, limiting themselves to a quick inspection of the quarters in which the deceased lived, that is, the sheds Wilbur had recently fitted out. They made a voluminous report which they submitted to Aylesbury Court, and it appears that the disputes over the fate of the estate are still unresolved among the countless Waitleys, both of the degenerate and non-degenerate branches, who live in the valley watered by the upper course of the Miskatonic. An almost interminable manuscript written in strange characters in a large ledger, 
and which gave every impression of a kind of diary by the existing separations and the variations of ink and calligraphy, completely puzzled those who found it in the old desk that used to be doubles as Wilbur's workbench. After a week of discussion, it was decided to send it to Miskatonic University, along with the deceased's collection of books on arcane lore, for study and eventual translation. But after a short time even the best linguists understood that it was not going to be an easy task to decipher it. On the other hand, not the slightest trace was found of the ancient gold with which Wilbur and Old Waitley used to pay their debts. The horror broke out during the night of September 9th. The noises from the mountain had been very intense that afternoon and the dogs barked with phenomenal noise throughout the night. Those who got up early on the tenth noticed a peculiar stench in the atmosphere. About seven o'clock in the morning Luther Brown, the farmhand of George Corey's farm, situated between Cold Spring Ravine and the town, ran down in a great agitation from the ten-acre pasture where he had grazed the cows. He was terrified as he stumbled into the farmhouse kitchen, while the equally terrified cows began to kick and bellow pitifully in the corral, following the boy all the way back as frightened as he was. Panting hard, Luther tried to blurt out what he had seen to Mrs. Corey. Upstairs, on the path above the ravine, Mrs. Corey, something's up there. It is as if lightning had struck. All the bushes and saplings along the path have been mowed down as if a whole house had run over them. And that's not the worst, whoa. There are footprints on the road, Mrs. Corey, tremendous circular footprints as big as a barrel lid, and deep in the ground, as if an elephant had gone through it, only the footprints will be more than four feet. I looked closely at one or two before running off and could see that they were all covered in lines fanning out from the same place, as if they were large palm fronds, only two or three times as large, embedded in the path. And the smell was overpowering, just like the smell around the old Waitley house. Arriving here the boy hesitated and it seemed as if the fear that had made him run all the way overcame him again. Mrs. Corey, seeing that she could get no more details out of him, began to telephone the neighbors, which began to spread panic, a foretaste of new and greater horrors, throughout the region. When he called Sally Sawyer, a housekeeper at Seth Bishop's farm, the closest estate to the Waitleys, she had to listen instead of talk, for Sally's son Chauncey, unable to sleep, had come upstairs. Down the slope towards the Waitley's house and hurried down in a terrified fright, after one glance at the farm and the pasture where the bishop's cows had spent the night. Yes, Mrs. Corey, Sally said quaveringly from the other end of the telephone line. Chauncey just came back terrified, and he could hardly speak of the fear he brought. He says old Waitley's whole house has been blown up and there's a lot of scrap wood all over the floor as if a charge of dynamite had gone off inside. There is hardly anything left but the floor of the ground floor, but it is entirely covered in some kind of horrible-smelling goo that runs across the floor to where the scattered pieces of wood are. And in the corral there are some horrible footprints, tremendous circular footprints, bigger than the top of a barrel, and everything is full of that sticky substance that you see in the destroyed house. Chauncey says the trickle runs all the way to the pasture, where there's a strip of land much bigger than a barn flattened and stone fences fallen to the ground everywhere. Chauncey says, Mrs. Corey, that he was terrified at the sight of Seth's cows. He found them in the tall grass, very close to Devil's Hop Yard, but they were pitiful to see. Half were dead, and most of the rest had sucked their blood, and had sores just like the ones that had grown on Waitley's cattle from the day Lavinia's black lad was born. Sets out to check on the cows, though I highly doubt he'll go anywhere near Wizard Waitley's farm. Chauncey didn't stop to look in the direction of the big flattened path past the pasture, 
but he thinks it was headed for the ravine path that leads to the village. Take my word for it, Mrs. Corey, there's something loose out there that doesn't suggest anything good to me, and I think that Black Wilbur Waitley, who met the horrendous end he deserved, is behind it all. He was not an entirely human being, and for the record, this is not the first time I have said that. Old Waitley must be raising something even less human than himself in that house all nailed up. There have always been unseen beings prowling around Dunwich, unseen beings that are neither human nor do they bode well. The earth was talking last night, and towards dawn Chauncey heard the nightjars make such a racket in cold spring gorge that he was not allowed to sleep at all. Then he thought he heard another faint noise towards Wizard Waitley's farm, a sort of splitting or creaking of wood, as if some great wooden crate or crate were being opened in the distance. Between one thing and another, he didn't get the least bit of sleep until well into the day, and he got up not long before that this morning. Today he intends to go back to the Waitley estate and see what happens there. But you've seen more than enough, I tell you, Mrs. Corey. I don't know what will happen, although it does not bode well. Men should get organized and try to do something. This is all truly frightening, and I think my turn is coming up. Only God knows what will happen. Has Luther told you about the direction the gigantic footprints were taking? No. Well, Mrs. Corey, if they were on this side of the ravine road and haven't been seen by your house yet, I suppose they must have gone down to the bottom of the ravine where else could they be? I have always said that the Cold Spring Ravine is not a healthy place and it does not inspire me the slightest confidence. The night jars and fireflies in their guts don't look like God's creatures, and some say you can hear strange noises and murmurs down there if you listen in the right place, between the waterfall and the bear's den. About noon three-fourths of the men and young men of Dunwich went out to search the lanes and meadows between the recent ruins of what had been the Waitley estate and the Cold Spring Ravine, looking in awe with his own eyes the great and monstrous footprints, bishops dying cows, all the mysterious and stinking desolation that reigned over the place and the crushed and pulverized vegetation across the fields and roadsides. Whatever evil had been unleashed on the region, it was certain that it was at the bottom of that enormous and gloomy ravine, for all the trees on the slopes were bent or cut, and a great avenue had opened through the undergrowth. That grew on the precipice. It gave the impression that an avalanche had swept away an entire house, precipitating it through the tangled forest of the almost sheer slope. No noise came from the bottom of the ravine only a distant and indefinable stench was perceived. There is nothing strange, then, that men prefer to stay on the edge of the precipice and start arguing, instead of going down and entering fully into the lair of that unknown cyclopean horror. Three dogs that accompanied the group began to bark furiously at first, but once at the edge of the ravine they stopped barking and seemed frightened and uneasy. Someone telephoned the Aylesbury Chronicle with the news, but the editor, accustomed to hearing the most incredible stories from Dunwich, merely wrote a humorous article on the subject, an article that would later be reproduced by the Associated Press. That night all the inhabitants of Dunwich and the country were withdrawn into their homes, and there was not a farm or stable in which the door was not barred as solidly as possible. Needless to say, not a single head of cattle spent the night on the pastures. About two in the morning a foul stench and the furious barking of dogs woke the family of Elmer Fry, whose farm was situated at the eastern end of Cold Spring Ravine, and they all agreed that they had heard some kind of splashing outside. Or dry blow. Mrs. Fry proposed to telephone the neighbors immediately, but as her husband was about to tell her to do so, a loud voice was heard. A creaking of wood that came to interrupt his deliberations. The noise seemed to come from the stable, 
and was immediately followed by the eerie bellowing and stamping of the cows. The dogs foamed at the mouth and curled up at the feet of the Fry family members, terrified. The owner of the house, moved by force of habit, lit a lantern, but he knew well that going outside into the dark yard meant death. Children and women were whimpering, but they avoided making any noise, obeying some obscure, atavistic sense of self-preservation that told them that their lives depended on their absolute silence. Finally, the noise of the cattle subsided to nothing more than plaintive lowing, followed by a series of impressive clicks, creaks, and roars. The fries, huddled in the living room, did not dare move at all until the last echoes had faded far into the cold spring ravine. Then, amidst the low bellowing still emanating from the barn and the devilish screeching of the last nightjars still awake at the bottom of the ravine, Selina Fry staggered to the phone and spread everything she knew about the second phase of the horror to the four winds. The next day the whole country was in a terrible panic, and a continuous movement of frightened and silent groups of people could be seen approaching the place where the horrifying night event had taken place. Two impressive strips of destruction stretched from the ravine to Fry's farmhouse, while monstrous footprints littered the bare ground and a face of the old red-painted barn lay toppled to the ground. Of the animals, it was only possible to find and identify a quarter. Some of the cows were pulverized into small fragments and those that survived had no choice but to slaughter them. Earl Sawyer proposed going to Arkham or Aylesbury for help, but many rejected his proposal as useless. Old Zebulon Waitley, from a branch of the family halfway between sanity and degradation, ventured, quite unbelievably, that it would be best to hold rituals on the mountaintops. Traditions had always been scrupulously observed in his family, and his memories of singing in the great stone circles had nothing to do with what Wilbur and his grandfather might have done. Night fell on the distraught country of Dunwich, too passive to mount an effective defense against the impending threat. In some cases, closely connected families huddled under one roof to keep an eye out in the pitch-black darkness, but usually the barricade-raising scenes of the previous night and the futile ineffective gestures of loading the rusty muskets and placing the pitchforks within easy reach. However, nothing new happened that night except for the occasional intermittent noise on the mountain, and at daybreak many hoped that the new horror would have disappeared as quickly as it appeared. There were even some reckless spirits who proposed launching a punitive expedition to the bottom of the ravine, although they did not venture to lead by example to a majority that, at first, did not seem willing to follow them. As night fell again the scenes of the barricades were repeated, although this time fewer families were grouped under one roof. The next morning, at both the Fry and Bishop Farms, there was some agitation among the dogs and indistinct sounds and foul smells in the distance, while the early risers were horrified to see again and recent, the monstrous tracks on the road that bordered Sentinel Hill. As on previous occasions, the edges of the road were crushed, an indication that the imposing and monstrous infernal horror that devastated the region had passed through it. This time the shape of the track seemed to suggest that he had walked in both directions, as if a shifting mountain had come out of Cold Spring Gorge only to return later along the same path. At the foot of the mountain, a strip of brush and crushed saplings thirty feet wide could be seen at its most abrupt, and those who saw it were astonished to find that not even the steepest slopes made the trajectory of the inexorable twist. Path Whatever it was, this horror could scale sheer, bare rock walls. As the expedition members chose to climb to the top by a safer route, they found that once they reached the top, the tracks ended, or, rather, they turned around. It was precisely there, at the top of Sentinel Hill, 
where the Waitleys used to celebrate their fiendish bonfires and sing their no less infernal rituals before the table-shaped stone on the dates of May Eve and All Saints' Day. The stone now formed the center of a wide expanse of land swept away by the horror of the mountain, while above its slightly concave surface was visible a thick, fetid mass of the same bituminous substance that had been on the floor of the ruined farmhouse. Of the Waitleys when the horror was gone. The men looked at each other and whispered something in each other's ears. Then they looked down. Apparently the horror had descended by much the same path it had ascended. All speculation idle. The reason, the logic and the normal ideas that could occur to them were submerged in the most complete morass. Only the old man Zebulon, who was not accompanying the group, would have been able to fully appreciate the situation or find a possible explanation for it all. Thursday night began the same as almost all the previous ones, but it ended much worse. The night jars in the ravine did not stop screeching for a moment, making such a noise that many Dunwich residents could not sleep, and around three in the morning all the phones in the town began to ring tremulously. Those who picked up the receiver heard a terrified voice utter in a piercing tone, Help! My God! And some thought they heard a thunderous noise, after which the voice was cut off. Not another sound was heard. But no one dared to come out and it was not known until the next morning where the call came from. Everyone who heard her called each other on the phone, noting that they only didn't answer at the Fry house. The truth came out within an hour when, hastily assembling, a group of armed men headed for the Fry estate at the very mouth of the ravine. What was there was frightening, but it was by no means a surprise. There were new crushed stripes and monstrous tracks. The Fry house had sunken like an eggshell, and no remains of it, living or dead, could be found among the ruins. Only an unbearable stench and a bituminous stickiness. The Fry family had been completely wiped off the face of Dunwich. Chapter 8 Meanwhile, in Arkham, behind the closed door of a room lined with bookshelves, Another phase of the horror was unfolding, somewhat more peaceful but no less spiritually stimulating. Wilbur Waitley's strange manuscript or diary, given to Miskatonic University for timely translation, had been the cause of much headache and not a few signs of bewilderment among the ancient and modern language specialists on the faculty. Its very alphabet, despite the similarity that at first sight it kept with the variant of Arabic spoken in Mesopotamia, was totally unknown to the authorities on the matter. The final conclusion of the linguists was that the text represented an artificial alphabet, and must be cryptograms, although none of the normally used cryptographic methods could provide the slightest clue for its decipherment, despite being applied depending on the languages that the linguists were supposed to know author of those pages. As for the old books found in the Waitley's house, while they were of great interest and in several cases promised to open up dark new avenues of inquiry among philosophers and scientists, they did nothing to solve the enigma. One of them, a heavy volume with a metal closure, was written in another equally unknown alphabet, although its characters were very different and bore some resemblance to Sanskrit. Finally the old ledger fell into the hands of Dr. Armitage, both because of his special interest in the Waitley case and because of his vast knowledge of languages and experience in ancient and medieval mystical formulae. Armitage knew that the alphabet was used for esoteric purposes by certain arcane cults from ages past, which had adopted numerous rituals and traditions from the dowsers of the Saracen world. Now, this was only of secondary importance, since it was not necessary to know the origin of the symbols if, as I suspected, they were used as cryptograms within a modern language. He was convinced that, given the voluminous amount of text it contained, the author would hardly have bothered to use a language other than his own, 
except perhaps when expressing certain magical formulas or special incantations. Consequently, he set out to attack the manuscript on the assumption that the bulk of it was in English. Armitage knew very well, after the repeated failures of his colleagues, that the enigma that contained the text would be difficult to unravel and would be a very difficult task, so any attempt to apply simple research methods had to be discarded. He dedicated the last ten days of August to compiling all the cryptographic treatises he could find, making use of the copious bibliography that the library had and deciphering night after night the arcane knowledge that was hidden in texts such as Tritomio's Polygraphia, the De Giambattista Portas for Tivus Literarum Natus, De Viginer's Trait de Schiffers, Falconer's Cryptomenesis Patifacta, the 18th-century treatises of Davis and Thickness and others by. Authorities on the subject as recent as Blair, Vaughn Martin, as well as Kluber's writings. In time he became convinced that he was dealing with one of those particularly subtle and ingenious cryptograms in which many separate and corresponding lists of letters are arranged like a multiplication table, the message being constructed by from arbitrary keywords known only to insiders. The older authorities seem to be of far more valuable help than those of more recent times, from which Armitage deduced that the manuscript code must be of great antiquity, no doubt handed down through a long chain of mystical essayists. Several times he seemed to be on the verge of seeing the enlightening light, but suddenly some unforeseen obstacle made him go back in the march of the investigation. Until, practically already on top of September, the clouds began to clear up. Certain letters, as they were used in certain passages of the manuscript, were definitively and unequivocally identified, revealing that the text was written in English. On the afternoon of September 2, the last major barrier to the intelligibility of the text finally fell, and Armitage found his efforts crowned by reading for the first time an entire passage from Wilbur Waitley's Annals. It was actually a diary, as everything suggested, and it was written in a style that clearly showed a mixture of profound erudition in the field of the occult and general ignorance on the part of the strange being who wrote it. Already the first long passage that Armitage managed to decipher, an entry dated November 26, 1916, was quite astonishing and unsettling. He remembered that the author of those lines was a three-and-a-half-year-old boy at the time, although he appeared to be a teenager of twelve or thirteen. Today I learned the aklo for the Sabaoth, sick, but I didn't like it because it could be answered from the mountain and not from the air. The thing upstairs is way ahead of me than I thought, and it doesn't seem like I have much of an earth brain. Going to bite me, I shot Jack, Elam Hutchins' sheepdog, and Elam said if he bit me he would kill me. I trust you don't. Last night my grandfather made me pronounce the magic formula dough and I thought I saw the secret city at the two magnetic poles. Once the earth is devastated I will go to those poles, if I fail to understand the dona formula when I learn it. Those of the air told me on the Sabbath that the task of raising the earth will take me many years, I guess grandpa will be dead by then so I'm going to have to learn the position of all the angles of flat surfaces and all the magic formulas between year and NHHNGR. Those outside will help me, but to take corporeal form they require human blood. It looks like the above will look good. I can catch a glimpse of it when I make the vorish sign or blow the Ibugazi powders, and it looks a lot like them on May Eve on the mountain. The other side I find somewhat blurry. I wonder what I will be like when the earth has been devastated and not a single being is left on it. The one who came with the Aklo Sabaoth said that I could transfigure myself to look less like an outsider and still do things. Dawn found Dr. Armitage sweating and terrified, totally absorbed in his reading. He hadn't lifted his eyes from the manuscript all night. Sitting at his desk, in the light of an electric lamp, 
He turned page after page with a trembling hand as he deciphered the cryptic text. In such a state of agitation he had telephoned his wife to tell her that he would not be going to sleep that night, and when he brought her breakfast the next morning at the library hardly tasted a bite. He did not stop reading for a moment throughout the day, stopping with great despair from time to time whenever it became necessary to reapply the intricate key to unravel the text. Lunch and dinner were brought to his office, but he barely took a pinch. The next day, late at night, he fell asleep in his chair, but would soon wake up after nightmares almost as horrible as the threat that hung over all humanity and that he had just discovered. On the morning of September 4, Professor Rice and Dr. Morgan insisted on seeing Armitage for even a moment, leaving the interview trembling and with a grim countenance. In the evening Armitage went to bed, but was able to sleep only sporadically. The next day, Wednesday, he again immersed himself in reading the manuscript and took countless notes, both of the passages he was reading and of those already deciphered. In the early morning he fell asleep for a few moments in an armchair in the office, but before dawn he was already looking at the manuscript again. It was not yet twelve o'clock when his doctor, Dr. Hartwell, came to see him and insisted, for his own good, on the need for him to stop working. But Armitage refused to follow the doctor's advice, saying that it was vitally important for him to finish reading the diary, while promising a more detailed explanation in due course. That afternoon, just as it was starting to get dark, he finished his amazing and exhausting read and slumped back in his chair totally exhausted. His wife, who came to bring him his dinner, found him lying in a near comatose state, but Armitage was still conscious enough to utter a phenomenal scream, which made her jump back as her eyes fell on the notes she had written. Taken. Rising from his chair, he scooped up the scrawled sheets on the table and stuffed them into a large envelope that he tucked into the inside pocket of his coat. He still had the strength to make it home on his own, but it was so obvious that he needed medical help that Dr. Hartwell had to be called urgently. When he went to bed, following the doctor's instructions, he kept repeating over and over again, but what to do, my God? What to do? Armitage slept through the night, but the next day he was delirious fitfully. He gave no explanation to Dr. Hartwell, but in his lucid moments he spoke of the urgent need to have a long meeting with Rice and Morgan. No one could understand his rantings, making desperate calls for the destruction of something he said was in a hermetically boarded-up house, while making incredible allusions to a plan to wipe out all of humanity from the face of the earth. Human species, and all plant and animal life, which proposed to carry out a terrible and ancient race of beings from other sidereal dimensions. In his screams he said things such as the world was in danger, for the elder beings had proposed to dismantle it and sweep it out of the solar system and the cosmos of matter to plunge it into another level, or incorporeal phase, from which it had emerged billions and billions ago. Of millennia. At other times he asked me to bring him the fearsome Necronomicon and Remigio's Demonolatria, both volumes in which he was convinced of finding the magic formula with which to ward off such terrifying danger. We have to stop them, we have to stop them anyway. He started screaming desperately. The Waitleys set out to lead the way, and the worst of all is yet to come. Tell Rice and Morgan that something has to be done. It's an operation. Which is very dangerous, but I know how to make the powders. He hasn't had any food since August 2nd, the day Wilbur came here to die, and by now. But Armitage, despite his seventy-three years, still had a hardy nature, and the disorder passed in the course of the night, and was not accompanied by fever. On Friday he woke up late in the day, with a clear head,
although his face was grim with the fear that gnawed at his guts and with the tremendous responsibility that now weighed on him. On Saturday afternoon he felt strong enough to go to the library and have a meeting with Rice and Morgan, the three men racked their brains for the rest of the day with the most incredible speculations and the most amazing debates. They took scores of terrible books on arcane lore from the shelves and from the places where they were safely locked up, and they were copying schemes and magical formulas with feverish haste and in vast numbers. There was not the slightest doubt about it. All three had seen the dying body of Wilbur Waitley lying prostrate in a room in that very building, so it never occurred to any of them to regard the diary as the delusions of a madman. Opinions on the advisability of giving an account to the Massachusetts police were found, with the ultimate refusal being imposed. There were things in everything that were very difficult, if not impossible, to believe for those who were not aware of everything that was happening there, as would very well be seen after several investigations carried out after the fact. Late in the evening the session adjourned without a definite plan having been drawn up, but all through Sunday Armitage was busy collating magic formulas and making combinations of chemicals taken from the university laboratory. The more he thought about the infernal diary, the more doubts assailed him as to the efficacy of any material agent in destroying the being that Wilbur Waitley had left behind, the menacing being, unknown to him, that a few hours later was to descend on the town. And would tragically become known for the Dunwich Horror. Monday hardly differed from the day before for Armitage, since the task on which he was embarked required continuous research and experiments. New consultations of the diary of that monstrous being brought as a consequence a series of changes in the plan originally drawn up, and, with everything, he knew that in the end it would continue to suffer from great flaws and risks. By Tuesday he had already outlined a precise line of action and believed that in less than a week he would be in a position to move to Dunwich. But with Wednesday came the big shock. Almost unnoticed, in a corner of the Arkham Advertiser, was a small Associated Press dispatch jokingly commenting that whiskey smuggled into Dunwich had produced a record-breaking monster. Armitage, stunned by the news, immediately phoned Rice and Morgan. Far into the night they debated plans to follow, and the next day they hastily set out to make preparations for the journey. Armitage knew full well that they were going to have to deal with terrifying forces, but he also saw clearly that it was the only way to put an end to this evil mess that others before him had come to complicate and aggravate. Chapter 9 Armitage, Rice, and Morgan drove to Dunwich on Friday morning, arriving in town around 1 p.m. It was a fine day, but even in the strong sun there seemed to portend an eerie calm, as if something dreadful were looming over those strangely domed mountains and deep, shadowy ravines of the ravaged country. From time to time a gloomy circle of stones could be seen silhouetted against the sky on the mountaintops. From the atmosphere of quiet tension in Osborne's store, the three investigators understood that something horrible had happened, and they soon learned of the disappearance of Elmer Fry's house and entire family. All afternoon they wandered about Dunwich, asking people what had happened, and seeing with their own eyes, in mounting horror, the dreadful ruins of the Fry house with its lingering remains of that bituminous substance, the hideous tracks left in the barnyard, Seth Bishop's badly injured cattle, and the impressive swaths of raised vegetation everywhere. The path left along the length of Sentinel Hill seemed to Armitage of almost devastating significance, and for a long time he stared at the sinister altar-shaped stone on its summit. Finally, the Arkham investigators, learning that some police officers from Aylesbury had arrived that morning in response to the first telephone calls reporting the tragedy that had befallen the Fry family, decided to go in search of the agents and compare their impressions of the situation with them. The Situation
but it was one thing to say it and another to do it, since the policemen were nowhere to be seen. There had been five of them in a car, which had been found abandoned near the ruins of Elmer Fry's pen. The locals, who had only been talking to the policemen a little while ago, were just as perplexed as Armitage and his companions. It was then that old Sam Hutchins had an idea and, livid, nudged Fred Farr, pointing down into the deep, oozing chasm that yawned before them. My God! He gasped. Look, I warned them not to go down the ravine. It never occurred to me that anyone was going to get in there with those footprints and that smell and with the nightjars making such a racket in broad daylight. A chill ran through everyone in the room, farmers and researchers, at the words of old Hutchins, and they all instinctively pricked up their ears. Armitage, now that he found himself for the first time facing the horror and its destructive work, could not help but tremble at the responsibility that was upon him. Night would soon fall over the country, the hours when the gigantic monstrosity would emerge from its lair to continue its fearsome raids. Negotium Perambulans in Tenebris The old librarian began to recite the magic formula that he had memorized, while his hand crumpled the paper that contained the other alternative formula that he had not memorized. Next, he checked that his flashlight was in perfect condition. Rice, what? Standing beside him, he took a sprayer of the kind used to combat insects from a briefcase, while Morgan unholstered the hunting rifle in which he continued to trust despite the warnings of his companions that the weapons would be worthless in front of him. So monstrous to be. Armitage, who had read Wilbur's shocking diary, knew full well what kind of materialization to expect, but he did not want to further frighten Dunwich's residence with further hints or clues. He hoped that he could rid the world of this horror without anyone knowing the threat that hung over all of humanity. As the darkness deepened, Dunwich's residents began to scatter and head home, eager to lock themselves inside despite the evidence that no bolt or lock could withstand the onslaught of such a being. Enormous force that could chop down trees and crush houses at will. They shook their heads as they learned of the investigators' plan to stand guard at the ruins of Fry's farm near the ravine. Bidding farewell to them, they hardly harbored any hope of seeing them alive again the next morning. That night there was a tremendous roar in the mountains, and the night jar screeched with a devilish noise. From time to time, the wind that rose from the bottom of the cold spring ravine brought an unbearable stench to the already charged night atmosphere, a stench like the one those three men had already perceived on a previous occasion when facing that dying creature that for fifteen and a half years he passed for a human being. But the long-awaited monstrosity was not seen all night. There was no doubt, what was at the bottom of the ravine was waiting for the right moment, and Armitage told his companions that it would be suicidal to try to attack it in the middle of the night darkness. At dawn the noises stopped. The day arose gray, bleak and with occasional squalls of rain, while dark clouds gathered on the other side of the mountain in a northwesterly direction. The three Arkham scientists did not know what to do. As the rain increased, they took shelter under one of the few buildings of the Fry Farm that still stood, where they debated whether to continue waiting or risk going down to the bottom of the ravine in search of the monstrous and abominable prey. The downpour intensified at times and in the distance the roar produced by thunder could be heard, while the sky was resplendent from the lightning bolts that tore it apart, and very close to where they were, a bolt of lightning was seen to fall as if it were heading directly into the sky. Damn ravine! The sky darkened completely, and the three scientists hoped that the storm, although violent, would pass quickly and then lighten up. The sky was still covered with dark clouds when, not even an hour ago, a veritable babble of voices came up to them, coming up the road.
Soon, a terrified group made up of more than a dozen men could be seen running, and they did not stop shouting and even sobbing hysterically. One of the leading marchers sputtered nonsense, and the Arkham investigators felt an eerie chill as the words cohered. Oh my God, my God, someone was heard to say with a breathy once. Come back again, and this time in broad daylight. It's out, it's out, and it's moving right now. May the Lord protect us. After hearing a few gasps, the voice sank into silence, but another of the men picked up the thread of what the first was saying. Almost an hour ago Zeb Waitley heard the phone ring. The caller was Mrs. Corey, George's wife, the one who lives down at the crossroads. He said that Luther, the boy, had gone out in search of the cows when he saw the tremendous lightning that struck, when he observed that the trees were bent at the mouth of the ravine, on the opposite side of the slope and smelled the same stench that was in the vicinity of the big footprints on Monday morning. And according to her, Luther said he heard some kind of crack or splash, a noise much louder than trees or bushes bending, and suddenly the trees on the edge of the road leaned to one side and there was a sound. A horrible sound of footsteps and a splash in the mud. But apart from the bent trees and brush, Luther saw nothing. Then, beyond where Bishop's Creek runs under the road, he could hear some awful cracking and popping noises on the bridge, and he said it sounded as if it were cracking wood. But apart from the bent trees and brush, he saw nothing at all. And when the creaking faded away, on the path that leads to Wizard Waitley's farm and to the top of Sentinel Hill, Luther had the courage to go to the place where the noises had first been heard and look down at the ground. There was nothing to be seen but water and mud, the sky was overcast and the falling rain was beginning to wash away the tracks, but near the mouth of the ravine, where the trees had fallen to the ground, there were still such horrible tracks as gigantic. Like the ones you saw last Monday. Arriving here, the man who had spoken first took the floor. But that's not the bad thing, that was just the beginning. Zeb summoned the people and all. They were listening when a phone call from Seth Bishop's house was cut off. Sally, Seth's wife, wouldn't stop talking. In a very heated tone, he had just seen the felled trees at the edge of the road, and he said that a kind of choked noise, similar to that of an elephant's footsteps, was heading towards the house. Then he said that a dreadful smell suddenly seeped into every corner of the house and that his son Chauncey kept shouting that the smell was just like the smell in the ruins of Waitley Farm on Monday morning. And, to all this, the dogs did not stop launching horrible howls and barking. Suddenly Sally gave a great whoop and said that the shed by the road had collapsed as if the storm had blown it away only there was hardly any wind to think of such a thing. We all listened attentively and through the wire you could hear the gasp of a multitude of throats glued to the telephone. Suddenly Sally uttered a hideous scream again, and said that the fence in front of the house had just collapsed, though there was not the slightest sign to indicate what that might be. Then everyone on the line heard Chauncey and old Seth Bishop yelling, too, and Sally was yelling that something huge had struck the house, not lightning or anything, but something huge coming down. Against the facade and the attacks were constant, although nothing could be seen through the windows. And then, and then. Terror could be seen on every face, and Armitage, even though he was no less terrified, had the poise to tell whoever had the word to go on. And then, then Sally gave a blood-curdling scream and said, Help! The house is collapsing. And from the other end of the wire we could hear a phenomenal crash. And an awful screaming, just like Elmer Fry's farm, only worse this time. The man who was speaking paused, and another of those who came in the group continued the story. That was it.
Not a sound or squeak was heard again. Only the most absolute silence. Those of us who listened to him got out our cars and trucks, and then we gathered at Corey's house as many healthy, strong men as we could find, and we've come here for advice on what to do next. It is possible that it is all a punishment from the Lord for our iniquities, a punishment from which no mortal can escape. Armitage saw that the time had come to do something, and with a determined air he addressed the wavering group of terrified peasants. There is no choice but to follow him, gentlemen, he said, trying to make his voice as reassuring as possible. I think there's a chance to finish off whatever that monster is once and for all. You are all well aware of the reputation of witches that the Waitleys had, well, this abominable being has a lot of witchcraft, and to put an end to it you have to resort to the same procedures that they used. I have seen Wilbur Whateley's diary, and have examined some of the strange old books I used to read, and I think I know the spell that must be cast to make it disappear forever. Naturally, there can be no talk of complete security, but it's worth a try. It's invisible, as I'd imagined, but this long-range sprayer contains some powder that should make it visible for a moment. In a while we will see it. He really is a terrifying creature, but it would have been even worse if Wilbur had stayed alive. It will never be known exactly what humanity got rid of with his death. Now we only have one monster to fight, but we know it can't multiply. Still, it may still do a lot of damage, so we shouldn't hesitate to rid the town of such a monster. You have to follow it, then, and the way to do it is to go to the farm that was just destroyed. Somebody go ahead, I don't know these roads well but I suppose there must be a shortcut. They agree. The men fidgeted, not knowing what to do, and Earl Sawyer, pointing a sooty finger through the fading sheet of rain, said softly, I think the fastest way to Seth Bishop's farm it is to cross the meadow below and ford the stream where it is shallow, then up the carrier stubble and the woods below. Eventually you come to the high road that runs alongside Seth's farm which is on the other side. Armitage, Rice, and Morgan began walking in the indicated direction, while most of the villagers trailed slowly behind them. The sky was beginning to clear up and everything seemed to indicate that the storm had passed. When Armitage inadvertently went in the wrong direction, Joe Osborne would point it out and lead the way. The courage and confidence of the men in the group grew by the moment, although the twilight light of the leafy, almost sheer slope at the end of the shortcut, between whose fantastic and ancient trees they had to climb as if it were a ladder, put those qualities to the test. Eventually, they came to a muddy road just as the sun was rising. They were a little further than Seth Bishop's estate, but the felled trees and the unmistakable and hideous footprints were good proof that the monster had already passed through there. They only stopped for a few moments to contemplate the remains that remained around the great hole. It was exactly the same as what happened to the Frias, and nothing dead or alive could be seen among the ruins of what had once been the bishop's farm and stable. Nobody wanted to stay there for long between that unbearable stench and that bituminous viscosity, they all instinctively returned to the path of hideous tracks leading toward the ruined Waitley Farm and the altar-topped slopes of Sentinel Hill. As they passed what had been Wilbur Waitley's home, everyone in the group visibly shuddered and their spirits began to falter. There was nothing fun in tracking something as big as a house and not being able to see it, even though there was an evil infernal presence in the air. In front of the foot of Sentinel Hill the tracks left the path and the crushed and chopped vegetation could still be seen fresh along the wide strip that marked the path followed by the monster in its previous ascent and descent of the mountain. Armitage took out a powerful telescope and began to scan the green slopes of Sentinel Hill. Then he passed it to Morgan, who had sharper vision. After looking through the device for a moment, 
Morgan uttered a fearful cry, passing it on to Earl Sawyer, pointing at a certain point on the slope with his finger. Sawyer, as clumsy as most who aren't used to using optical instruments, pondered for a few seconds before finally, with Armitage's help, he managed to center the target. Locating the point, her scream was even more shrill than Morgan's. God Almighty, the grass and bushes are moving. It's going up, slowly, like it's crawling, right now it's reaching the top. Heaven help us. The germ of panic seemed to spread among the expedition members. It was one thing to go hunting for the monstrous being, and quite another to find it. It was quite possible that the spells would work, but what if they failed? Voices began to rise asking Armitage all kinds of questions about the monster, but no answer seemed to satisfy them. Everyone had the impression of being very close to absolutely extraordinary phases of nature and life and radically alien to the very existence of humanity. Chapter 10 In the end, the three investigators from Arkham, the gray-bearded Dr. Armitage, the stocky, silver-haired Professor Rice, and the thin, boyish-looking Dr. Morgan, went up the mountain alone. After patiently instructing the villagers on how to focus and use the spyglass, they left him with the frightened group left behind on the trail. As those three men went up, the villagers passed it from hand to hand so they could see them up close. The climb was arduous, and on more than one occasion they had to give Armitage a hand. Far above the striving expeditionary group, the great path opened and the mountain rumbled as if its infernal maker were once again passing through it with daring treachery. Thus, it was clear that the pursuers were gaining ground. Curtis Waitley, of the non-degenerate Waitley branch, was the one looking through the glass when the Arkham investigators strayed off the trail. Curtis told the rest of the group that the three men were undoubtedly trying to reach a lower ridge overlooking the trail, high above where the vegetation was currently being crushed. And so it was in reality, since the expedition members reached the small elevation shortly after the invisible monster passed by. Then Wesley Corey, who was looking through the lens, yelled at the top of his voice that Armitage had been adjusting the sprayer Rice was carrying, and everything indicated that something was going to happen at any moment. Uneasiness began to spread among the group on the road, because, according to what they had been told, the spray should make the unknown horror visible for a few moments. Two or three men closed their eyes, while Curtis Waitley snatched the glass from Wesley and aimed it as far away as possible. He could see that rice, from the observation point where the expedition members were, above and just behind the monstrous being, had an excellent opportunity to try to spread the powerful powders with prodigious effects. The rest of those on the path could only see the fleeting glow of a grayish cloud, a cloud the size of a relatively tall building, near the top of the mountain. Curtis, who was currently looking through the glass, slammed it down into the ankle-deep mud with a terrifying scream. He staggered, and would have fallen to the ground had it not been for two or three companions who helped him up and held him up. An almost inaudible moan was the only thing that came out of his lips. Oh, oh, almighty God! That, that! The monstrous being is gone forever, said Armitage. It has returned to the bosom of what it was at the beginning and can no longer exist again. It was a monstrosity in a normal world. Only in a small part was it made up of matter, in any of the acceptations of the word. He was just like his father, and a large part of his being has merged with him again in some unknown realm or dimension beyond our material universe, in some unknown abyss from which only the most devilish rites of human malevolence would allow him to escape after invoking him for a few moments on the mountain tops.
There followed a brief silence, during which the scattered senses of the unfortunate Curtis Waitley slowly weaved themselves together again into a kind of continuity, and raising his hands to his head he gave a low groan. Memory brought him back to the moment when she had left him, and the horrific vision that had made him faint came back to him. Oh, oh, my God, that half-human face, that half-human face! That face with red eyes and curly albino hair, and no chin, just like the Waitleys. It was an octopus, a centipede, some kind of spider, but he had a half-human shaped face on top of it all, and he looked like the wizard Waitley, only he was yards and yards tall. And, exhausted, he fell silent, while the entire group of villagers stared at him with a bewilderment not yet crystallized into renewed terror. Only then did old Zebulon Waitley, who used to come back to old memories but who hadn't said a word until now, said aloud. Fifteen years ago, he began to ramble, I heard old Waitley say that one day we would hear Lavinia's son speak his father's name on the top of Sentinel Hill. But Joe Osborne interrupted him to ask the Arkham men again. But what was it, after all? and how did the young wizard Waitley manage to call it? To come from the spaces. Armitage chose his words carefully in answering. It was, well, it was above all a force that does not belong to the zone we inhabit in outer space, a force that acts, grows, and obeys laws other than those that govern our nature. It never occurs to any of us to invoke such beings from the outside. Only the most abominable people and cults try. And something of this may be said of Wilbur Waitley, enough to make him demonic and a precocious monster, and to make his death a scene of devilish pathos. The first thing I intend to do is burn this accursed newspaper, and if you want to act like prudent men, I advise you to blow up the altar stone as soon as possible. On that top and tear down all the circles of monoliths that rise on the other mountains. It is things like this that, in the end, bring about beings like those that the Waitleys liked so much, some beings that they were going to give terrestrial form so that they would erase the human species from the face of the earth and drag the our planet at the bottom of some execrable place for some purpose of an equally execrable nature. But as for the creature we have just returned to its place of origin, the Waitleys bred it to play a terrible part in the monstrous events that were to come. It grew fast and became very big for the same reasons Wilbur did, but it outgrew him because it had a greater component of exteriority. And it's needless to ask why Wilbur called him out of space. He didn't call him. It was his twin brother but he looked more like his father than he did. Then there was pandemonium, everyone wanted to ask questions at once, and only Henry Wheeler picked up the spyglass that had fallen to the ground and cleaned the mud off it. Curtis kept gibbering and couldn't even come up with isolated answers. It's bigger than a stable, all made of twisted ropes. It's shaped like a chicken's egg, but huge, with a dozen legs like large half-closed barrels that will be rolled. It doesn't look like it has anything. Solid, it is of a gelatinous substance and made of loose, twisted strings, as if they had been glued together, it has innumerable huge bulging eyes, ten or twenty mouths or trunks sticking out of all sides, as big as chimney pipes, and they don't stop moving, opening, and closing continuously, all gray with some kind of blue or purple rings. God in heaven! And that semi-human face on top. The memory of that last thing, whatever it was, was too strong for poor Curtis, and he lost consciousness before he could utter another word. Fred Farr and Will Hutchins moved him to the side of the road, leaving him lying on the wet grass. Henry Wheeler, trembling, took the glass in his hands and trained it on the mountain in an attempt to see what was happening. Through the lens three small figures could be seen climbing toward the summit as fast as the steep slope allowed. 
That was all he saw, no more, no less. Then they all heard a strange, untimely noise coming from the bottom of the valley behind them, even coming out of the underbrush on Sentinel Hill. It was the shout that a legion of nightjars put together, and in its strident chorus a tense and malignant expectation seemed to beat. Earl Sawyer then took up the glass and said that the three figures were seen standing on the highest peak, practically level with the stone altar, but still at a considerable distance from it. One of the men, Earl Sawyer said, seemed to raise his arms above his head at rhythmic intervals, and as he said this the others thought they heard a faint, almost musical sound in the distance, as if a loud chant accompanied his gestures. The strange silhouette on that distant peak must have been quite a grotesque and impressive spectacle, but none of those present were in the mood to make aesthetic considerations. I imagine they're chanting the spell now, Wheeler said quietly, snatching the telescope from Sawyer's hand. Meanwhile, the night jars screeched with a singular shrillness and a curiously irregular rhythm, which bore no resemblance to the modulations of the ritual. Suddenly, the sunlight dimmed without, at first sight, being due to the action of any cloud. It was a truly singular phenomenon, and so was appreciated by all. It seemed as if a loud roar was brewing inside the mountains, strangely in tune with another roar that would come from the firmament. A bolt of lightning tore through the air, and the astonished men searched in vain for signs of the storm. The chanting of the Arkham investigators now carried clearly to them, and Wheeler saw through the glass that their arms were raised in time with the words of the spell. The angry barking of dogs could also be heard on a distant farm. The changes in the tonalities of the sunlight increased and the men crowded along the path continued to look perplexedly at the horizon. A purplish gloom, caused by a spectral darkening of sky blue, hung over the rumbling hills. Immediately, lightning ripped through the sky again, somewhat more dazzling than the previous one, and everyone believed they saw as if a kind of nebulosity was rising around the stone altar there on the distant peak. No one, however, was looking through the telescope at those moments. The night jars continued to make their irregular chirps, while Dunwich's men braced themselves. In the midst of great tension, to face the imponderable threat that seemed to hover in the atmosphere. Suddenly, and without anyone expecting it, some deaf, broken and hoarse vocal sounds were heard that the members of the terrified group that heard them would never forget. But those sounds could not come from any human throat, for the vocal organs of man are not capable of producing such acoustic atrocities. Rather, it would be said that they had come from Averno itself, if it were not quite evident that their origin was found in the stone altar of Sentinel Hill. And it is almost wrong to call such atrocities sounds, since their timbre, horrible as well as extremely low, was directed much more to dark pockets of consciousness and terror than to the ear, but one must qualify them as such, for their shape was reminiscent, irrefutably though vaguely of semi-articulated words. They were thunderous sounds, thunderous as mountain roars or thunder above which echoed, but not from any being visible. And since the imagination is capable of suggesting the wildest suppositions as far as invisible beings are concerned, the men grouped at the foot of the mountain crowded even closer if possible, and they fell back as if they feared that a blow would hit them. Fortuitous. Igne, Igne, THFLTHK Chenga. Yog Sothoth. Came the eerie squawk from space. YBTHNK, HEHI, NGRKDLLH. At that moment, whoever was speaking seemed to hesitate, as if some terrifying spiritual warfare was raging within them. Henry Wheeler refocused the glass but all he could see were the three grotesquely silhouetted human figures on top of Sentinel Hill, 
who kept waving their arms at a frenzied pace and making strange gestures as if the incantation ceremony were near. To its culmination. From what gloomy hellholes of diabolical Acheron's terror, from what unfathomable abysses of extracosmic consciousness, from what dark and secularly latent subhuman lineage came those half-croaking, half-thundering semi-articulate sounds. Suddenly, they were heard again with renewed force and coherence as they approached their maximum, final and most heartbreaking frenzy. Aiyahayayaya, NGTA, NGH triple A H ya. Help. Help. P P P P P P Father. Father. Yoji Sathath. That was it. The livid villagers who waited on the road, stunned by the indisputably English words that had echoed, profusely and thunderously, in the angry, empty space beside the amazing stone altar, would hear them no more. Immediately, they had to give a violent start before the terrifying detonation that seemed to rend the mountain, a deafening and imposing roar, the origin of which, whether it was the interior of the earth or the heavens, none of those present knew how to locate. A single ray fell from the violet zenith on the altar stone and a gigantic wave of immeasurable force and indescribable stench came down from the mountain, bathing the entire region. Trees, brush, and grass were obliterated by the furious onslaught, and the terrified villagers in the group at the foot of the mountain, weakened by the deadly stench that nearly suffocated them, nearly fell rolling to the ground. In the distance the angry barking of dogs could be heard, while the meadows and foliage in general withered to a strange and sickly grayish-yellowish hue, and the fields and woods were strewn with dead nightjars. The stench disappeared after a short time, but the vegetation did not sprout normally again. Even today, a strange and nauseating sensation continues to be perceived in front of the plants that grow in the vicinity of that mountain of unfortunate memory. Curtis Whateley was beginning to come to when the three Arkham men were seen slowly descending the mountain slope under the rays of an increasingly brilliant and immaculate sun. Their countenances were grave and calm, and they seemed dismayed by reflections on what they had just witnessed of a far more distressing nature than those which had reduced the group of villagers to a state of prostration and cowering. In response to the barrage of questions that rained down on them, the three investigators merely shook their heads and reaffirmed a vitally important fact.